This presentation is on biomechanics of gait. I'm Mary Lloyd Ireland from the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Gait can be difficult to understand, but normal gait is necessary for walking, running, and returning to sports. For those of us who take care of lower extremity injuries, it is critical to restore normal motion of the foot and ankle so that gait can be normalized. There's a swing phase and a stance phase. I would like to acknowledge Roger Mann for his contributions to orthopedist understanding foot and ankle injuries and treatment. His book, Surgery of the Foot, which has many editions after this. The first chapter, a very important chapter, is Biomechanics of the Foot and Ankle, written by Roger Mann of San Francisco. I highly recommend you read about biomechanics of the foot and ankle and gait in his textbook and others. I would also like to acknowledge Tom Bird from Nashville, Tennessee. He created the content of the video and narrated the video as well. You will see his models made out of wood that make us appreciate the oblique axes of the ankle and how it relates further down to the subtalar joint and all the way down into the windlass mechanism. The walking cycle is divided into stance phase, which is 60%, swing phase, 40%, and a double limb support occurs in walking that is 10% when both feet are on the ground difference in walking and running is you don't have double limb support in running. When we look at the different phases of gait, initially shown on the left, you have heel contact. And if we think about the time during the gait cycle, that's 25%. Then forefoot contact occurs. Mid stance is 50%, then heel off. And then there is the propulsive phase that occurs with heel off and toe off and then into the swing phase. Knowledge of the biomechanics of the foot and ankle is paramount to understanding the kinematics of the human locomotor system. The ankle axis is obliquely oriented in the coronal plane such that plantar flexion results in inward deviation of the foot while dorsiflexion results in outward deviation. This oblique orientation allows horizontal rotation to occur between the foot and leg with ankle movement. With the foot fixed on the ground, dorsiflexion results in internal rotation of the tibia, while plantar flexion results in external rotation. This model illustrates this rotational relationship. The axis of rotation of the subtalar joint is close to 45 degrees from the horizontal. Thus, internal rotation of the tibia is directly linked to subtalar eversion, and external rotation occurs with inversion as demonstrated here. The transverse tarsal articulation, consisting of the talonavicular and calcaneal cuboid joints, allows subtalar motion while the forefoot remains fixed on the ground. It should be noted that the transverse tarsal joint becomes rigid with supination and is mobile allowing a flexible midfoot in pronation. This model further demonstrates the relationship of internal and external rotation of the tibia with eversion and inversion of the hind foot along with simulation of the medial and lateral rays of the foot. The ankle axis, when the foot is fixed on the ground, is very important to understand as well. When the foot dorsiflex, the tibia internally rotates, and when the foot plantar flex, the tibia externally rotates. 
This is different than if the foot is not on the ground. The subtalar joint, eversion and inversion, are directly tied to internal and external rotation of the tibia. When we walk, it's like a controlled fall. So as you look here with the overlay of the model, internal rotation of the tibia results in eversion of the talus. External rotation of the tibia results in inversion of the talus. Opposite motions. These must be normal to have normal gait. If there is an injury to the ankle resulting in loss of range of motion or the subtalar joint, then gait will be abnormal until that motion is restored. The transverse tarsal articulation is comprised of the calcaneocuboid and talonavicular articulation, and it functions as one joint. These articulations are shown with a circle. The metatarsophalangeal break occurs when the heel is elevated. The weight-bearing forces are evenly distributed across the metatarsal heads. Metatarsal break is shown in C on the right. Metatarsal break shown with the red lines. See the orientation of it. The wind last action or wind last mechanism occurs as the foot goes from foot flat with great toe dorsiflexion. There is increased tension on the plantar aponeurosis caused by dorsiflexion of the toes and then elevation of the longitudinal arch, the wind last mechanism. The events of the walking cycle, there are three intervals. The first interval is heel strike to foot flat. During this interval, there is rapid ankle plantar flexion. The foot is loaded in pronation. The subtalar joint goes into eversion and the lower leg internally rotates. So the subtalar joint is doing the opposite of what the foot is and what the tibia is. So it's a controlled fall. Eversion unlocks the transverse tarsal joint. And the main thrust during this first interval is force absorption and dissipation. The second interval is from foot flat to heel off. The ankle dorsiflexes, the subtalar joint inverts, the lower limb externally rotates, the inversion due to the ankle oblique axis and plantar aponeurosis and metatarsal break. Stability of the transverse tarsal joint is increased by inversion, and the midfoot goes from being flexible to being rigid during this second interval. So this is shown in the graphs from Roger Mann's book. The first interval is on the left, the second interval is on the right. So during this first interval, percentage of body weight, you go from no weight to a rapidly greater than 100% weight in the first interval. As the heel strike occurs, and then you go up on the toe. The percentage of body weight during the second interval reduces. Looking at the range of motion immediately with heel strike, there is plantar flexion that occurs. And then dorsiflexion starts again in the second interval. Looking at the subtalar rotation, first interval. There is pronation, then supination, the rotation of the tibia during the first interval is internal rotation, then going into external rotation. 
We need to look at all of these activities together with body weight, joint rotation, EMG activity. The third interval is heel lift to toe off. The occurrences during this, in this interval are ankle rapid plantar flexion, the windlass effect of the plantar aponeurosis stables, stabilizes the longitudinal arch. Let me do that again. In the third interval, heel lift to toe off, there is ankle rapid plantar flexion. The windlass effect of the plantar aponeurosis occurs, which stabilizes the longitudinal arch. Subtalar joint inverts to maximize the rigidity of the transverse tarsal joint, and the body is propelled forward at toe-off. Third interval, body weight gradually is reduced as we go into the swing phase. Ankle goes from dorsiflexion to plantar flexion. Foot goes into supination, and the tibia goes into external rotation. The third interval creates a rigid lever for, pu for push-off, the ankle undergoing that rapid plantar flexion. You can see the first interval on the left-hand side of the video, and then the third interval that windlass effect of the aponeurosis occurs as the toes go into dorsiflexion, and the subtalar joint continues to invert, which is enhanced by that oblique axis of the ankle. That obliquity of the ankle axis maximizes the rigidity of the transverse tarsal joint at toe-off. So the joints must act as flexible joints and then be rigid during parts of the gait cycle. During gait, coupled motions between ankle and subtalar joints. In the first interval, the tibia internally rotates, the talus everts, the foot goes into pronation. In the third interval, the tibia externally rotates, talus inverts, and the foot supinates. If we think about these with abbreviations, which works better for me to remember, normal gait is a controlled fall. Think about what happens to the joints when the foot is on the ground. So the foot goes into dorsiflexion at heel strike. The tibia internally rotates. The talus everts and the foot pronates during the first portion of gait. Direp D. I, R, E, P. Then as we go into toe off, the foot plantar flexes and the tibia externally rotates, the talus inverts, and the foot supinates. P, I, R, I, pyrus, P, E, R, I, S. Notice that the talus does opposite of what the foot and tibia do. And again, we're in a controlled fall trying to stay upright. Dire P, Paris. Relationships of the tibia, talus, and foot during gait. Treadmill is a very good way to evaluate gait. You can have the patient walking on the treadmill and running on the treadmill, looking for asymmetry one side compared to the other. It's important to concentrate on the foot and ankle like we have during this presentation. But another important place to look is up at the hip. Look for any dynamic Trendelenburg. When heel strike occurs, there should be an obliquity of the hip to indicate adequate hip muscle abductor external rotation strength such that the right hemipelvis will go up as he is in heel strike here. So observation of gait by walking and running is very effective 
gait analysis in a gait lab is even more effective. But therapists, athletic trainers can certainly look at gait, simple treadmill, and videotape this and get feedback back to the patients and athletes. View from the front, showing the overlay of the ankle, the oblique axis of the ankle, the forward fall that occurs, foot going into pronation, talus going into eversion, tibia going into internal rotation, and then the opposite effect as you go up on your toes. Mechanics of running. The basic kinematics of the foot and ankle are not significantly altered. The gait cycle is shortened. Stance phase is shortened. The vertical forces during stance phase increase up to three times body weight. And the range of motion of the joints is increased 50%. The phasic activities of the lower extremity muscles are altered as well. I hope this gives you some perspective on the important intricate relationships of the foot and ankle, this mitered hinge of the ankle, and how the joints work in an intricate relationship for normal gait. Thank you for your attention. Try not to get tripped up.